Okay, that's the, the, fir the first part of this lecture. I uh, ended with a question, what makes this a linear viscoelastic uh, behavior? So I will now uh, give an answer to this uh, question and also uh, what are the implications of dealing with linear viscoelasticity. So the definition of linearity is if The definition of linearity is the ability or the, the permission to use superposition. In um, formal notation, that means that the response to some summation of two inputs can be separated into the response due to the first one added to the response of the second one. So if we are allowed to do this, then we, have, uh, we are dealing with a linear system, or in our case, a linear material. So let's see how can this concept, and we assume that this concept applies, is uh, applicable to our case. Let's take this uh, more complex uh, stress history. What we have here is a material that is exposed, this is still a 1D case, a material that is exposed to two uh, step stress, uh, two step stresses. The first, uh, let's uh, say that the first time stress was applied occurred when the time was equal to tau 1, and then the second stress occurred when time was equal to tau 2. So I'm using a, a different uh, measure uh, or a different uh, parameter for time just to, ex to express when the loads were applied. And uh, this is equivalent to the story I told you before, where you have a material, this elastic material, linear, that is uh, loaded. Now we start the clock running, and at some point we place a mass on top of this material, and at some later point we place another mass. The first mass and the second mass, they do not have to be the same, and that is delta sigma 1 and delta sigma 2 are, are different. Delta sigma 1 happens when the clock was showing, this is the clock running, the clock was showing time to be tau 1, and delta sigma 2 was added, mass number two was added when the clock was showing uh, tau two. Now we would like to understand what would be the strain response to this type of stress history. So I think you would agree that before delta sigma one was applied, nothing was going on, and the stress, this is plotting stress versus time, the stress was uh, zero. There was nothing happening before. The material now is uh, exposed to sigma, delta sigma one, we know that there is going to be a small jump in the stress. This is the instantaneous uh, response. And then there's going to be some kind of creep because delta sigma one is, is uh, applied. I want to um, think now about the situation where delta sigma two would never be would not be applied and delta sigma one would continue indefinitely. In this case, this would be the response of the material. It would continue to creep according to what we learned uh, just now. However, there is a new stress state applied here. And this additional stress state is going to generate a small jump in the stress at this point, in the strain at this point, and then there's going to be extra creep because of the new stress state. Now, what superposition is telling us that in fact, this uh, stress history, delta sigma one and then delta sigma two applied at a later stage, we can split them into two, where there's two problems and we solve the strain response to the first where only delta sigma one is applied and then for so we solve for delta sigma two and then we add up the effects. I'll try to make this uh, here. Imagine that the stress history was delta sigma one applied at time one until infinity. And then we have at tau, time tau two, delta sigma two applied until infinite time. The strain response, and I will just uh, plot over this, the strain response due to delta sigma one would be a small jump and then grip and the strain response due to delta sigma 2 only would be a, a small jump here when tau equal tau 2, and then creep. If we sum up 1 and 2, we are expecting to get the correct outcome. And let's see how this works. When tau, at tau 1, at time tau 1, delta sigma 1 was applied, this would be the strain response. This is identical to line number 1. Now, line number 1 continues here. This is the dashed line the curve that I was uh, uh, plotting earlier. And then the response to delta sigma two that starts at tau two, this is the difference between the two. So what we have here is two, and what we have here is one, and then the addition is just adding them one on top of the other. So the overall strain response is 
this. Let's try to make this, uh, to write this in a formal way. So as long as the time is before time one, tau one, the strain is zero. Now we have this period where t is greater than or equal to tau one, but before time before time was tau two, or before the second stress uh, uh, jump was applied, we know that the strain was behaving as follows: t, and then t minus tau one delta sigma one. You don't need to be confused by the fact that I removed tau one from t because t is when the clock was starting and there was nothing happening. We just need to count the time difference since delta sigma one was applied, which means we have to remove from the, the counting clock the, the time when, when delta sigma one was applied, which is tau one. So there is just uh, this shifting expressed here by taking t minus tau one. Now, um, let's see what happens when the time is greater than or equal to tau two. I will write and then explain. So. we have here is that the strain at any time t of interest, as long as the time we're interested in is larger than, than tau 2, is equal to d, the grip compliance of the material, evaluated at t minus tau 1 times delta sigma 1. That is the effect of the first stress step that uh, remains on top of the element and uh, its effect continues over time. And then we have here t minus tau 2, which is the time elapsed since delta sigma 2 was applied. And this is the grip compliance evaluated at that time, multiplied by the stress step, which is delta sigma 2. So here we have the response for the second input, and here we have the response for the first input, and here we have the response for both of them. So this is basically the superposition principle applied to the idea of linear viscoelasticity. Now, I want to make a, a small notation changes so I can generalize this uh, response. First, Delta sigma is really a function of, of tau. And uh, we can write that delta sigma 1, which is the stress jump at time tau 1, is basically delta sigma when tau was equal to tau 1. And delta sigma 2, similarly, is going to be delta sigma when tau was equal to, or when time was equal to tau 2. If this is the case, then this expression that is written here, we have delta sigma 1, delta sigma 2, I would like to replace them. And instead of delta sigma 1 and delta sigma 2, write delta sigma at time tau 1, and then delta sigma at time tau 2. That doesn't change a lot, but uh, it, it is helpful. Because it's really easy to see that if we have more than two steps, it is possible to write the strain at any time t of interest as the summation of all the stress steps t, t minus tau i, where tau i is when a stress step was applied, and then we have delta sigma at time tau i. So this is a generalization of two steps to as many steps as you're interested in. And then if you think of delta sigma as being very small, this is the discrete analog to what is known as the Boltzmann superposition principle, or the convolution integral, or the hereditary integral. You can see how it is analogous. This is a continuous analogy of this. So the strain at any time t of interest is an integration from tau equals zero to t over all the stress steps, considering the time elapsed since they were applied within the grip compliance. So um, Boltzmann superposition is, is one way that you can find this integral in the literature. I'll just write this.
you will see this equation or this formulation in the literature as Boltzmann superposition principle, convolution integral, or hereditary integral. What is interesting to point out, and this is in relation to uh, uh, computation, uh, computational power, is that this integral basically says that the value of the strain right now at time t, in order to answer what is the strain level now, one has to calculate or sum up the effects from the day the material was born until now. So every stress application that was ever incurred by the material has to be included in the integral because the integral starts from zero when the material was born and ends up at time t, which is the current time that we're interested in the strain value. Imagine for a, a road where you have hundreds of thousands of cars traveling and I would like to point at a certain location and ask what is the strain level at this location now? The answer to that should be, I would like to know how many, in order to answer that, I would, I would need to know how many cars passed and what was the load level of each car? And that is something that is uh, unreasonable. But this is the challenge in the payment business where you have viscoelastic materials. You have to include the history of the of the loading in order to know what is the condition now. And this is why sometimes this is uh, this is why it is called hereditary integral, as if you inherit things that happened in the past and you cannot forget them, and you have to include them in your current uh, behavior. <laughs>